A Grain of Truth Part 1 A number of black points moving against the bright sky streaked with mist drew the witcher's attention. Birds. They wheeled in a slow, peaceful circle, then slowly swooped and soared up again, flapping their wings. The witcher observed the birds for a long time, then, bearing in mind the shape of the land, density of the wood, depth, and course of the ravine, which he suspected lay in his path, calculated the distance to them and how long he would take to cover it. Finally, he threw aside his coat and tightened the belt across his chest by two holes. The pommel and hilt of the sword strapped across his back peeked over his shoulder. We'll go a little out of our way, Roach, he said. We'll take a detour from the highway. I don't think the birds in, are circling there for nothing. The mare walked on, obedient to Geralt's voice. Maybe it's just a dead elk, said Geralt, but maybe it's not. Who knows? There was a ravine. As he had suspected, the witcher scanned the crowns of the trees tightly filling the rift. But the sides of the gully were gentle, the riverbed dry and clear of black thorns and rotting tree trunks. He crossed it easily. On the other side was a copse of birches, and behind it a large glade, heath and undergrowth, which threw tentacles of tangled branches and roots upward. The birds, scared away by the appearance of a rider, soared higher, croaking sharply in their hoarse voices. Geralt saw the first corpse immediately. The white of the sheepskin jacket and matte blue of the dress stood out clearly against the yellowing clump of sedge. He didn't see the second corpse, but its location was betrayed by the three wolves, sitting calmly on their haunches, watching the witcher. His mare snorted, and the wolves, as if at a command, unhurriedly trotted into the woods, every now and again turning their triangular heads to watch the newcomer. Geralt jumped off his horse. The woman in the sheepskin and blue dress had no face or throat, and most of her left thigh had gone. The witcher, not leaning over, walked by her. The man lay with his face to the ground. Geralt didn't turn the body over seeing that the wolves and birds hadn't been idle, and there was no need to examine the corpse in detail. The shoulders and back of the woolen doublet were covered with thick black rivulets of dried blood. It was clear the man had died from a blow to the neck, and the wolves had only found the body afterward. On a wide belt next to a short cutlass in a wooden sheath, the man wore a leather purse. The witcher tore it off, and item by item threw the contents on the grass. A tinderbox, a piece of chalk, sealing wax, a handful of silver coins, a folding shaving knife with a bone handle, a rabbit's ear, three keys and a talisman with a phallic symbol. Two letters written on canvas were damp with rain and dew, smudged beyond readability. The third, written on parchment, was also ruined by damp, but still legible. It was a credit note made out by the dwarves' bank in Murville to a merchant called Rul Asper, or Aspen. It wasn't for a large sum. Bending over, Geralt lifted the man's right hand as he had expected. The copper ring digging into the swollen blue finger carried the sign of the armorer's guild, a stylized helmet with visor, two crossed swords, and the rune. A engraved beneath them. The witcher returned to the woman's corpse as he was turning the body over. Something pricked him in the finger, a rose pinned to the dress. The flower had withered, but not lost its color. The petals were dark blue, very dark blue. It was the first time Geralt had seen such a rose, turned the body over completely and winced. On the woman's bare and bloody neck were clear bite marks, and not those of a wolf. The witcher carefully backed away to his horse, without taking his eyes from the forest edge. He climbed into the saddle, he circled the glade twice, and leaning over, looked around, examining the ground closely. So, Roach, he said quietly, the case is reasonably clear. 
The armor and the woman arrived on horseback from the direction of the forest. They were on their way home from Murville, because nobody carries an uncashed credit note for long. Why they were going this way and not following the highway, I don't know. But they were crossing the heath side by side and then, again, I don't know why, they both dismounted or fell from their horses. The armorer died instantly. The woman ran, then fell and died. And whatever attacked her, which didn't leave any tracks, dragged her along the ground. With her throat in its teeth, the horses ran off. This happened two or three days ago. The mare snorted restlessly, reaching to his tone of voice. The thing which killed them, continued Geralt, watching the forest's edge, was neither a wolf nor a leshy. Neither would have deft so much for the scavengers. If there were swamps here, I'd say it was a Kikimora or a viper. But there aren't any swamps here. Leaning over, the witcher pulled back the blanket which covered the horse's side and uncovered another sword strapped to the saddleback. One with a shining ornate guard and black corrugated hilt. Well, Roach, we're taking a roundabout route. We'd better check why this armor and woman were riding through the forest not along the highway. If we pass by ignoring such incidents, we will never earn enough for your oats, will we? The mare obediently followed forward, across the heath, carefully sidestepping hollows. Although it's not a werewolf, we won't take any risks, the witcher continued, taking a bunch of dried monk's head from a saddlebag and hanging it by the bit. The mare snorted, Geralt unlaced his tunic a little and pulled out a medallion engraved with a wolf with bare jaws. The medallion, hanging on a silver chain, bobbed up and down in rhythm to the horse's gait, sparkling in the sun's rays like mercury. Part 2 He noticed the red tiles of the tower's conical roof from the summit of a hill as he cut across a bend in the faint trail, the slope covered with hazel, dry branches and a thick carpet of yellow leaves wasn't safe to descend on horseback. The witcher retreated carefully, rode down the incline and returned to the main path. He rode slowly, stopped the horse every now and again, and hanging from the saddle, looked out for tracks. The mare tossed her head, neighed wildly, stamped and danced on the path, kicking up a storm of dried leaves. Geralt, wrapping his left arm around the horse's neck, swept his right hand, the fingers arranged in the sign of Aixia, over the mount's head as he whispered an incantation. Is it as bad as all that? he murmured, looking around and not withdrawing the sign. Easy, Roach, easy. The charm worked quickly, but the mare prodded with his heel, moved forward reluctantly, losing the natural springy rhythm of her gait. The witcher jumped nimbly to the ground and went on by foot, leading her by the bridle. He saw a wall. There was no gap between the wall and the forest, no distinct break. The young trees and juniper bushes twined their leaves with the ivy and wild vines clinging to the stone wall. Geralt looked up. At that same moment, he felt a prickle along his neck, as if... An invisible soft creature had latched on to his neck, lifting the hairs there. He was being watched. He turned around smoothly. Roach snorted. The muscles in her neck twitched, moved under her skin. A girl was standing on the slope of the hill he had just climbed down, one arm resting on the trunk of an alder tree. Her trailing white dress contrasted with the glossy blackness of her disheveled hair, falling to her shoulders. She seemed to be smiling, but she was too far away to be sure. Greetings, he said, raising his hand in a friendly gesture. He took a step toward the girl. She turned her head a little, following his movements. Her face was pale, her eyes black and enormous. The smile, if it had been a smile, vanished from her face as though wiped away with a cloth. Geralt took another step. The leaves rustled underfoot, 
and the girl ran down the slope like a deer, flitting between the hazel bushes. It was no more than a white streak as she had disappeared into the depths of the forest. The long dress didn't appear to resist her ease of movement in the least. Roach neighed anxiously, tossing her head. Geralt, still watching the forest, instinctively calmed her with a sign again, pulling the mare by the bridle. He walked slowly along the wall, wadding through burdock up to the waist. He came to a sturdy gate with iron fittings and rusty hinges, furnished with a great brass knocker. After a moment's hesitation, Geralt reached out and touched the tarnished ring. He immediately jumped back as, at the moment, the gate opened, squeaking, pattering, and raking aside clumps of grass, stones, and branches. There was no one behind it. The witcher could only see a deserted courtyard, neglected and overgrown with nettles. He entered, leading Roach. The mare, still stunned by the sign, didn't resist, but she moved stiffly and hesitantly after him. The courtyard was surrounded on three sides by a wall and the remains of some wooden scaffolding. On the fourth side stood the mansion, its facade modeled by a pox of chipped plaster, dirty damp patches, and festooned with ivy. The shutters with their peeling paint were closed, as was the door. Geralt threw Roach's reins over the pillar by the gate and slowly made his way toward the mansion, following the gravel path past the small fountain full of leaves and rubbish. In the center of the fountain, on a fanciful plinth, a white stone dolphin arched, turning its chipped tail upward. Next to the fountain, in what a very long time ago used to be a flower bed, grew a rose bush. Nothing but the color of the flowers made this bush unique, but the flowers were exceptional, indigo, with a faint shade of purple on the tips of some of the petals. The witcher touched one, brought his face closer, and inhaled. The flowers held the typical scent of roses, only a little more intense. The door and all the shutters of the mansion flew open at the same instant with a bang. Geralt raised his head abruptly. Down the path, scrunching the gravel, a monster was rushing straight at him. The witch's right hand rose as fast as lightning above his right shoulder while his left jerked the belt across his chest, making the sword hilt jump into his palm. The blade leaping from the scabbard with a hiss traced a short, luminous semicircle and froze, the point aiming at the charging beast. At the sight of the sword, the monster stopped short, spraying gravel in all directions. The witcher didn't even flinch. The creature was humanoid and dressed in clothes which, though tattered, were of good quality and not lacking in stylish and useless ornamentation. His human form, however, reached no higher than the soiled collar of his tunic, for above it loomed a gigantic hairy bear-like head with enormous ears, a pair of wild eyes and terrifying jaws full of crooked fangs in which a red tongue flickered like flame. Flee, mortal! The monster roared, flapping his paws but not moving from the spot. I'll devour you! Tear you to pieces! The witcher didn't move. He didn't lower his sword. Are you deaf? Away with you! The creature screamed, then made a sound somewhere between a pig squeal and a stag's bellowing roar, making the shutters rattle and clatter and shaking rubble and plaster from the sills. Neither witcher nor monster moved. Clear off while you still in one piece, roared the creature, less sure of himself. Because if you don't, then... Then what? interrupted Geralt. The monster suddenly gasped, tilted his monstrous head. Look at him. Isn't he brave? He spoke calmly, baring his fangs and glowering at Geralt with bloodshot eyes. Lower that iron, if you please. Perhaps you've not realized you're in my courtyard. Or maybe it's customary wherever you come from to threaten people with swords in their own courtyards. It is customary, Geralt agreed. 
when faced with people who greet their guests with a roar and the cry that they're going to tear you to pieces. Pox on it! The monster got himself worked up. And he'll insult me on top of it all. This straggler, a guest, is he? Pushes his way into the yard, ruins someone else's flowers, plays the lord, and thinks that he'll be brought bread and salt. Bah! The creature spat, gasped, and shut his jaws. The lower fangs protruded, making him look like a boar. So, the witcher spoke after a moment, lowering his sword. Are we going to carry on sounding like this? And what do you suggest instead? Lying down? Snorted the monster. Put that iron away, I said. The witcher nimbly slipped the weapon into its scabbard, and, without lowering his arm, stroked the hilt which rose above his shoulder. I'd prefer you, he said, not make any sudden moves. This sword can always be drawn again faster than you imagine. I noticed, rasped the monster. If it wasn't for that, you'd have been out of this gate a long time ago with my boot print on your arse. What do you want here? How did you get here? I got lost, lied the witcher. You got lost, repeated the monster, twisting his jaws in a menacing grin. Well, you'll lose your way. Out of the gate, turn your left, ear to the sun, and keep walking, and you'll soon get back to the highway. Well, what are you waiting for? Is there any water? asked Geralt calmly. The horse is thirsty. And so am I, if that doesn't inconvenience you. The monster shifted from one foot to the other and scratched his ear. Listen, you, he said. Are you really not afraid of me? Should I be? The monster looked around, cleared his throat, and yanked up his baggy trousers. Pox on it. What's the harm of a guest in the house? It's not every day I meet someone who doesn't run away or faint at the sight of me. All right, then. If you're a wary but honest wanderer, I'll invite you in. But if you're a brigand or a thief, then I warn you, this house does what I tell it to. Within these walls, I rule. He lifted his hairy paw. All the shutters clattered against the wall once more, and deep in the dolphin's stone gullet, something rumbled. I invite you in, he repeated. Geralt didn't move, scrutinizing him. Do you live alone? What's that to do with you? said the monster angrily, opening his jaws, then croaked loudly. Oh, I see. No doubt you'd like to know whether I've got forty servants, all as beautiful as me. I don't. Well, Pox! Are you going to make use of my generous invitation? If not, the gate's over there. Geralt bowed stiffly. I accept your invitation, he said formally. I won't slight the right of hospitality. My house is your house, Monster said in return, just as formally, although a little off-handedly. This way, please, dear guest, and leave the horse here by the well. The interior was in need of extensive repair although it was reasonably clean and tidy. The furniture had been made by skilled craftsmen, if a very long time ago. A pungent smell of dust hung in the dark rooms. Light! growled the monster, and the torch in its iron bracket burst into flames and sooty smoke. Not bad, remarked the witcher. The monster cackled. That's it? I see you won't be amazed by any old trick. I told you this house obeys my commands. This way, please. Careful, the stairs are steep. Light! On the stairs, the monster turned. What's that around your neck, dear guest? Have a look. The creature took the medallion in his paw, lifted it up to his eyes, tightening the chain around Geralt's neck a little. The animal has an unpleasant expression. What is it? 
my guild's badge. Ah, you make muzzles, no doubt. This way, please. Light! The center of the large room, completely devoid of windows, was taken up by a huge oak table, empty apart from an enormous brass candlestick, slowly turning green and covered with trinkles of hardened wax. At the monster's command, the candles lit and flickered, brightening the interior a little. One wall was hung with weapons, compositions of round shields, crossed partisans, javelins, and gusarms, heavy sabers, and axes. Half of the adjacent wall was taken up by an enormous fireplace, above which hung rows of flaking and peeling portraits. The wall facing the entrance was filled with hunting trophies, elks and stag antlers, whose branching racks threw long shadows across the grinning mounted heads of wild boar, bear, and lynx over the ruffled and frayed wings of eagles and hawks. The place of honor was filled by a rock dragon's head, tainted brown, damaged, and leaking stuff. Geralt examined it more closely. My grandpa killed it, said the monster, throwing a huge log into the depths of the fireplace. It was probably the last one in the vicinity when it got itself killed. Sit, my dear guest. You're hungry. I won't deny it. Dear host, the monster sat at the table, lowered his head, clasped his hairy paws over his stomach, muttered something while twiddling his enormous thumbs, then suddenly roared, thumping the table with his paw. Dishes and platters rattled like pewter and silver, chalices jingled like crystal. There was a smell of roast meat, garlic, marjoram, and nutmeg. Hirot did not show any surprise. Yes. The monster rubbed his hands. This is better than servants, isn't it? Help yourself, dear guest. Here is some fowl. Here is some boar ham. Here, terrine of... I don't know what. Something. Here we have some hazel gross. Pox, no. It's partridge. I got the spells muddled up. Eat up. Eat up. This is proper, real food. Don't worry. I'm not worried. Geralt tore the fowl in two. I forgot, snorted the monster, that you're not timid. What shall I call you? Geralt, and your name, dear host. Nivellen. But they call me Degan, or Fanger around here, and they use me to frighten children. The monster poured the contents of an enormous chalice down his throat, after which he sank his fingers into the terrine, tearing half of it from the bowl in one go. Frightened right children, repeated Geralt with his mouth full, without any reason I doubt. Of course not. Your health, Geralt. And yours, Nivellen. How's the wine? Have you noticed... That it's made from grapes and not apples. But if you don't like it, I'll conjure up a different one. Thank you. It's not bad. Are your magical powers innate? No. I've had them since growing this. This trap, that is. I don't know how it happened myself. But the house does whatever I wish. Nothing very big. I can conjure up food, drink, clothes, clean linen, hot water, soap. Any woman can do that, and without using magic at that. I can open and close windows and doors. I can light a fire. Nothing very remarkable. It's something. And this trap, as you call it. Have you had it long? Twelve years. How did it happen? What's it got to do with you? Pour yourself some more wine. With pleasure. It's got nothing to do with me. I'm just asking out of curiosity. An acceptable reason, the monster said, and laughing loudly. 
but I don't accept it. It's got nothing to do with you, and that's that. But just to satisfy your curiosity a little, I'll show you what I used to look like. Look at those portraits. The first from the chimney is my father. The second, Pox only knows. And the third is me. Can you see it? Beneath the dust and spider ribs, a nondescript man with a bloated, sad, spotty face and watery eyes looked down from the painting. Geralt, who was no stranger to the way portrait painters tended to flatter their clients, nodded. Can you see it? repeated Nivellen, baring his fan. I can. Who are you? I don't understand. You don't understand? The monster raised his head. His eyes shone like a cat's. My portrait is hung beyond the candlelight. I can see it, but I'm not human. At least, not at the moment. A human looking at my portrait would get up, go closer, and, no doubt, have to take the candlestick with him. You didn't do that. So the conclusion is simple, but I'm asking you plainly, are you human? Hero didn't lower his eyes. If that's the way you put it, he answered after a moment's silence. Then not quite. Ah, surely it won't be tactless if I ask. In that case, what are you? A witcher. Ah, Nivellin repeated after a moment. If I remember rightly, witchers earn their living in an interesting way. They kill monsters for money. You remember correctly. Silence fell again. Candle flames pulsated, flipped upward, in thin wisps of fire glimmering in the cut crystal chalices. Cascades of wax trickled down the candlestick. Nivellin sat still lightly twitching his enormous ears. Let's assume, he said finally, that you draw your sword before I jump on you. Let's assume you even manage to cut me down. With my weight, that won't stop me. I'll take you down through sheer momentum, and then it's teeth that'll decide. What do you think, Witcher? Which one of us has a better chance if it comes to biting each other's throats? Geralt, steadying the craft's pewter stopper with his thumb, poured himself some wine, took a sip, and leaned back into his chair. He was watching the monster with a smile. An exceptionally ugly one. Yes, said Nivellin slowly, digging at the corner of his jaws with his claw. One has to admit, you can answer questions without using many words. It'll be interesting to see how you manage this one. Who paid you to deal with me? No one. I'm here by accident. You're not lying by any chance? I'm not in the habit of lying. And what are you in the habit of doing? I've heard about witchers. They abduct tiny children whom they feed with magic herbs. The ones who survive become witchers themselves. Sorcerers with inhuman powers. They're taught to kill. And all human feelings and reactions are trained out of them. They're turned into monsters in order to kill other monsters. I've heard it said it's high time someone started hunting witchers as there are fewer and fewer monsters, and more and more witchers. Do have some partridge before it's completely cold. Nivellen took the partridge from the dish, put it between his jaws and crunched it like a piece of toast, bones cracking as they were crushed between his teeth. Why don't you say anything? He asked indistinctly, swallowing. How much of the rumors about you witches are true? Practically nothing. And that's a lie. That there are fewer and fewer monsters. True. 
There's a fair number of them. Yvelyn bared his fangs. One is sitting in front of you, wondering if he did the right thing by inviting you in. I didn't like your guild badge right from the start, dear guest. You aren't a monster, Nivellyn, the Witcher said dryly. Pox! That's something new. So what am I? Cranberry pudding? A flock of wild geese flying south on a sad November morning? No. Maybe I'm the virtue that a miller's bosom daughter lost in spring. Well, Geralt, tell me what I am. Can't you see I'm shaking with curiosity? You're not a monster. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to touch this silver tray. And in no way could you hold my medallion. Ha! Nivlin roared so powerfully. The candle flames fell horizontal for a moment. Today, very clearly, is a day for revealing great and terrible secrets. Now I'm going to be told that I grew these ears because I didn't like milky porridge as a child. No, Nivellyn, said Geralt calmly. It happened because of a spell. I'm sure you know who cast that spell.